Well, welcome to our second meeting of the Dorian Valiente Book Club in which we're discussing the rebirth of witchcraft. We are here with some friends from all over. I'm in my car. <laughs> I'm currently sitting on the shore of Lake Erie. Uh, we went to the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft in Cleveland last night. And, um, it's all of his artifacts from his life. They set up shop here. And, uh, and now we are on our way home. We sat, it's very breezy and beautiful by the lake. Yeah. Are you well, Maggie? Yes. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. It's lovely. Yeah. Is How are you? Well. <laughs> yes. Yes, so I'm fine. Thanks. My blood pressure has been a bit labile lately, but um, yeah. oh, it's my age. <laughs> It's good to see you. Yes. Yeah. But we have a, we have some chapters to discuss from the middle of the book. Is that right? Well, Marcos okay. started um, talking about this. And Alison was just uh, expounding on Fleet Street attacks. Right. And then we've got number 81, page 81, Christine, traditional witchcraft. Wonderful. So. I think we can just jump around too. It doesn't have to be in order. It's, it's, it's oh, quite good. fine. Why don't you continue with what you were talking about before I, I came in late? The Fleet Street attacks. Yes. Uh, Alison was was telling us some interesting. So, points. would you like me to just sort of do an off the cuff sort of summary of Fleet Street attacks? It was absolutely fascinating. I could not put it down when I was reading it because it's something I knew nothing about in terms of our history. So the thing that struck me most of all, which I, I mentioned earlier, was that there was all of these interviews happening during this period. I think it was um, 50s and also 60s. So it was very early on in our history. And Gerald was, I think the, the impression I got was Gerald would speak to anyone so long as it put the word out. But there were issues because new initiates were being initiated and it came up of how could we ask people who had taken an oath to not say anything when Gerald is doing interview after interview after interview and it talked about a split within the coven there were um very sort of pro saying nothing, just keeping quiet and just sort of riding things out. But they were also on the other camp and they mentioned um, a lady in a chap, I can't recall their name now, who were uh, with, with Gerald and they're very sort of pro publicity and so on and so forth. And it proceeded to go on about sort of how basically the, the ones who were sort of pro publicity ended up being se severely quite attacked in their sort of in their quest to get get wicker out there and so it would grow and so forth um to the point where people lost their jobs but the thing that i that struck me most of all was um at that point the witchcraft um bill had been repealed there was a period where a newspaper i think it may have been the daily mail i, I you'd have to double check me on that basically started a witch hunt and it, it was even brought up in Parliament about the fact of um, they wanted uh, the practice of witchcraft to be made sort of illegal. And it was brought up in in the Houses of Parliament. And Doreen, in true Doreen style, went along to Westminster and had a meeting with a chap and was like, hold on a minute. That's not what we are. This is what we are. And they and they in true British Doreen fashion, they had tea and it was wonderful. And she sorted it all out. And but I don't know if people realize just how close we came to another bill of witchcraft and it being made mm -hmm. illegal and punishable. And she stopped all of it. And it, that was I, I was in bed reading just like, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> so, um. Going forward, Gerald was quite severely attacked, quite severely mocked in the press, and so were others. And that part of the history is what brought about the split of the coven. And in the end, they did, in fact, split because of everything 
So yeah, that was the fleet uh, attack of Fleet Street and it was brutal, but also Doreen during that, I mean, hats off to the lady. Again, she just knocked it out the park and you know, who else would go to Westminster and be like, sorry chaps, that you've got it all wrong here. This is what we do and you know, <laughs> so and yeah amazing woman again amazing woman and if she hadn't have written it we wouldn't know it because I certainly wasn't aware of it I don't know were any of you aware of, of that before you'd read it no no <laughs> from this book yeah this is the only place I've ever heard it talked about yeah that um publicity seeking person was Jack Bracelin and his girlfriend apparently on page 69 Yeah, she she did not use her real name, and and I think that was probably wise of her because she really got a, a big hit, um, and that was unfortunate for her. Yeah, yeah. Ah, wonderful. I I love the the quote that um, I'm not sure what what page it's on on in the the published version, but my uh, my edition says uh, that uh, Gerald York said that Gerald Gardner was totally lacking in the fourth power of the Sphinx the power to remain silent um yeah. and uh, and i think that was probably true about him but he yes. he yeah. really liked to talk about what he was doing because he not just because he believed in it but because he thought it would keep it alive in the consciousness yeah. of the public and he i mean his comments like you know i recognize that this was bad publicity and yet it would have cost me thousands of pounds to get the same amount of publicity if i had paid for it I couldn't believe when I read that, but that's so true, though. <laughs> and there is yes. things nowadays where any, you know, any publicity is good publicity. So maybe. <laughs> I don't uh, think it. Did obviously, that's not what everybody thought. Yes. It the the whole sort of the way it was written and the the way that they were so attacked. And it was just the attack was through sheer ignorance because uh, they had people talking to them, but they weren't hearing what was being said. They had their own agenda and that was the only agenda that mattered. And that was so evident. But Doreen to the rescue at Westminster, that was just wonderful. Her level headedness and just um, take no bullshit attitude. I really appreciate that about her. And it led her away from Gerald Gardner. And she went off and did her own thing. And, and then later in this chapter, she talks a little bit about the schism that she just couldn't handle anymore about the laws of the craft and uh, her commentary on that. We still argue about that today. <laughs> yeah, that was fascinating as well, reading that. Um, so, does anybody have anything else about that bit there? No, no. Christine's got the next one, I believe, which is uh, traditional witchcraft. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's been a little while since I read, since I read this now, so I've got to try and refresh myself. But um, I wrote a bit down just to jog my memory. Um, I, I find that this this chapter is quite different from the rest of the book in, in respect to kind of it seems to be that Doreen is um, she's trying to explain to the reader what is traditional. She doesn't really know herself. I don't think anybody really knows. But I love that she puts the question mark there and she proves that um, I think she, she's not a fool in believing that what we choose to believe is traditional isn't any more than published and revered witches and scholars um, pulling bits and pieces from various sources and declaring their beliefs as traditional. Um, but amongst the mishmash, um, I think she finds that there's truths and practices that can come as close to traditional as possible. I suppose, because um, she's asking the question, um, she implies that despite many hypotheses, nobody can really know for certain due to the secret nature of the craft. But she seems to know what isn't traditional. Um, the pre-Christian pagan beliefs and practices are a big part of modern day witchcraft beliefs, but not necessarily deemed as witchcraft. 
Um, and she suggests that witchcraft is merely the remnants of old age practices that have survived the witch trials and attempts of a total eradication. Um, I think she's looking to ask the question. She wants to compare and differentiate what are believed to be old witchcraft practices with modern witchcraft, mostly, most commonly Wicca. I'm not going to read out everything I've read. I think uh, I've written, sorry. Um, for me, I think she's just, it's kind of like a how to be a witch, really. What, how to kind of go, it's like a manual, that, that particular chapter for me. And she's trying to, um, she's, she, this bit where, you know, saying about, um, sorry, sorry, I just got to try and um, get back to it in a minute. Um, it's like going naked and stuff, you know, discussing ritual nudity, seeming that the traditional witches prefer cloaks. It's kind of explaining that, you know, trying to, the, the, the demonization of witchcraft by Christians. Um, I think she's just trying to explain that it's not all like that, really. I, I, do you know what? I've written so much here. I don't know whether to just read it all out. Is that OK? <laughs> Right, okay, so she informs the reader that the word wicca is the old English word for male witch. Um, interestingly, as traditional witches were usually female, um, popular culture leads us to believe this, but she confirms, the word, confirms that the word wicca was for a female witch, so conclude, wick air, sorry, the female witch, so concludes that this was, there were words were both for existed alongside then she explores the word witch, which she believes to be likely derived from the Indo-European word wake, meaning things connected to religion and magic. She uses popular folklore, old sayings, woodcuts, all to inform, uh, all, uh, to inform of all the traditional associations with witchcraft, such as the Coven of Thirteen, pointed hats, the clothes in the garter, witches and fairies dancing in the ring, familiars, flying ointments, broomsticks, cauldrons, all these things that we define as witches, I suppose or were defined as witches. She suggests the witches were hidden in plain sight, disguising their consecrated objects as everyday items. Um, they could be white, black, gray, um, work alone or in caverns. But she suggests that solitary witches were considered more powerful. Um, they didn't need the combined powers of other witches. Um, witch blood running in families. Um, so she, anyway, this, I could go on and on and on. I've learned so much from this chapter. I'm so sorry that I feel it like it's, I'm not explaining it very well. Um, then she writes about the scourge of Christianity on witchcraft and quotes Perkins from his book, A Discourse on the Damned Art of Witchcraft. And she suggests that the Christian church demonized all pagan beliefs, uh, witchcraft being still active amongst regular folk, as the witch served and invoked powers that were not Christian, therefore they must be of the devil, uh, and didn't depend on the church. They were independent in their beliefs. So I suppose it's more that they couldn't be controlled. Um, Um, interestingly, she acknowledges that the sentiment goes on to present times, something I've got personal experience of, being brought up very strict Christian, born again, um, Pentecostals. And she writes about which, which is deities being that of the personification of the powers of nature, the creative force of male and female. Um, and, and hence why witchcraft uses the forms of God and goddess. But this isn't acceptable in the Christian church. Um, and then she goes up to go, it goes on to say about the current controversy of the ordination of women clergy. So that was kind of what was going on for her at the time she wrote it. Um, and she goes on to write on the past of knowledge and tradition, and it was written down. Um, so it was suggested the witch couldn't die unless she passed it on to a chosen successor who was handed down a legacy, which included objects. And, and memorized rituals. And the rituals were likely to be in doggerel verse or rhyme, which made it easy to remember. And I, I found that quite interesting, actually. I didn't realize that um, until I read this, really, why it is done that way. The objects passed out often as stand, candlesticks, jugs, jugs, items that could be passed off as being ordinary, 
So again, it's like saying, you know, about having to be hidden away because of the potential of persecution. Um, country witches would have herb gardens and then they'd hand down their tools for cutting or cooking. Um, effigies and pictures of the deities were rare, so they'd use other symbols like horns, antlers, corn dolls, um, fossils, flowers. So it was very simple. Um, so she makes a point the saying that witches were never anti-Christian. It was always the Christians that were anti-witch. Um, and you know, acknowledges as well that Jesus was considered by witches to have been a great teacher and healer. Um, and then she talks about possibly would he have been a witch as he was referred to having 12 disciples and then back to the group of 13. Um, she discusses the importance of the moon cycle, seasonal sabbats, um, but going back to, you know, the, the full moon would have been a time where people could go about their business and in the darkness, have enough light to do their rituals. So why we do things the way we do now is based on traditions that go way back before we had electricity or, you know, and when things had to be hidden away. Um, it seems like it's a bit of a guide, really, of why we're doing things the way we do now. Um, why we have a strong connection to nature, witchcraft, they don't abuse animals, really strongly kind of um, informing people really that this is what we don't do. This is what the Christians kind of demonize witches as doing really, um, like child abuse, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and she states quite clearly that both traditional and modern witchcraft agrees that witchcraft is tapping into the hidden powers of the mind in order to change an outcome. And everyone has the ability to do this with confidence and practice. So it's not, it's, she's saying that we can all become witches, I suppose, not just about things being handed down to us or witch blood, um, et cetera. And she quotes all sorts of different people. I and mean, she's so well read and well researched. Um, uh, she blows my mind with that really. Um, but she go, she concludes really that, um, let me see. In the conclusion, she proves that no, she's no fool in believing what we choose to believe is traditional, is no more than, you know, what we're told by scholars, I suppose. But you know, it, we can we can pick and choose really what we what we want to what we want to do and keep it updated, I suppose. Um, And I love how she cleverly throws in little snippets of information that seem insignificant, but later on when you read about it, you can learn more and, and delve deeper, maybe do your own research. Um, I think that's about it. That's all I've got to say. Sorry, it's a bit disjointed. It was very good, Christine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. A lot of uh, very interesting details, I think. Yeah. I think one of the most interesting things about this chapter is, is in reflecting on what we read earlier, Doreen's fiction and the ways in which she, she communicates her ideas about witchcraft through story. And this is not a story, but the ways that she weaves in, I think very effectively um, information. Uh, so some of it is, is traditional you know what she has discovered but she's very subtle about how she uses the words you know it has been told and the experience of and and she doesn't say this is a fact she says this is what people talked about and that's folklore like that's a very different telling and uh, and I think this whole chapter regardless of its grounding in fact feels very familiar to many of us and we go oh yeah yeah we, even if we're not practicing witches we might go oh this feels familiar in many ways. Uh, I like that about her writing that she sort of sort of um, conveys in a very comfortable like she did in her story, right? This was like the, the person who told about magical ways and the things that people did without being pushy about it and also without really conveying too much. It was it's, it's subtle. Do you know what I mean? I find it very, very interesting that she decided to put this chapter after all the 
descriptions on on what the, her experience of Gerald Garner, etc. Because she's not exactly as Maggie said, she's not saying it. She's not saying, actually, this is what I do now. But this traditional witchcraft that she's depicting, really, nowadays, after all the studies, after all the books have been published, uh, not last uh, the one uh, on on the Coven of Arthur, which I find extremely, extremely um, interesting and probably life changing for a lot of practitioners. Uh, what is she? What is uh, described in here? I, I think, if I well interpret it, is a lot of the practice of other traditions of witchcraft that she met. Uh, after she left um, the 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 well, well Bricketwood really uh, the the coven um, of Gerald, and it, however, it's interesting though because I was looking at at, at the biography and at the dates, and she she started to learn about these alternative ways in the sixties. But this book has been published um, at the end of the 80s. So my feeling is that she sort of chose a way of, of living witchcraft, um, which was heavily based on, on her second experience, so to speak, which is very... Um, I mean, again, it, for for I think for us who who are seekers in terms of learning about the history of Wicca, it's very interesting to to see how much she um, was uh, influenced by what she met after after Bricket. What isn't it? That, that's my feeling. Definitely, Marco. I, I think that is so true. She she had a whole lifetime of experience by then. And uh, in that in that interim period when she was very enthusiastic about other forms of witchcraft and then eventually walked away from that. As well, um, I think she just was sort of distilling and drawing on and 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 then she also did a ton of local research at that time. She was and then, of course, there's the next chapter in which it's a not at all research based, mm -hmm. but entirely UPG. And like that experience really impacted her as well. Um, we can get to that in a minute. Anything else about this chapter? I, I liked how when she was um, bringing into it books, how she stated about old books that were that were used in the in the day. And, you know, the astrology book was was called Christian Astrology. I just found that absolutely fascinating and went on eBay to see if I could find it, <laughs> you know, and, and also the, the book, uh, Paul Hewson, uh, Mastering Witchcraft. I was like, can I find that one too? So I just, I just absolutely love it. Things like this, until you, you actually sort of immerse yourself and read it in the context of the, the book in its entirety, it does not sink into mm -hmm. your psyche and your soul as much. And I just, she, like you were saying, she does that so well. She really, she takes you on a little path and just feeds you everything as and when you need it. It's just wonderful. It's so good. As I do that, when I'm reading her books, I sit and I'll write down <laughs> all of the ones that she mentions that are contact <laughs> Because inevitably I want to own yeah, them. I'm, and, I'm so glad you said that because I'm like, am I the strange one who's doing that? It's sort of happening. No, you are. <laughs> same here, same here. <laughs> Anything else that people were, oh, any ahas or notice things? One thing that I would say, which le leads us to this next chapter, is. Of course, according to my obsession for cult material culture, the objects, the objects. She mentions a lot of interesting objects, um, tools, uh, tools which are not, were not known before she wrote them down here. They were not known because they don't belong to um, 
Gardnerian tradition. But so she felt the need of, of sharing them, such mm-hmm. as the staff or stang, uh, or the old jug, which when I read this, for me it was it was a discovery. It was a discovery because I got to study some of these objects without knowing anything about them. (laughs) And my research is literally, let's find things in her books that can explain to me what what this object is. And I didn't know anything before about the Bellarmine jug. Mm -hmm. Never knew what it was, never heard about it, never seen it. Obviously, the only place where I've seen one is, is our collection. And I'm glad that Doreen actually explains to us what it is and why she owns one, because I couldn't, I absolutely couldn't imagine the reason why. So yeah, yeah. And these are, this is the, we know now, we know now uh, through articles and now from, from published books that many of these objects were, tra- were used traditionally in both the Coven of Arthur or the Club of Tubal Cain. So that, that's the historical side of things that obviously uh, contextualize uh, everything. It's interesting that in her experience in the next chapter, these objects will come again. I saw Maggie, you, you had something about this. I, I'm just, um, I know my connection is bad, so I apologize. Um, I was at this Buckland Museum last night and in the case they have Patricia Crothers. Maggie, we lost you for a moment. Jugs. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys got. <laughs> we lost you, Maggie, we lost you for a moment. They had Patricia Crowther objects. Uh, Patricia Crowther's uh, jugs were on display at the museum. I know I was, what? that was very funny. Um, uh, if you ever happen to be in the United States and want to go to the museum, it's not very big. <laughs> I <laughs> need to go. See, right? No, no, I, it, it's in my plans because I need to double okay. check a lot of things. Uh, you probably saw on display a very important set of artifacts, which is the heels of the swords, the um, <laughs> the swords that Gerald uh, asked uh, to be to, to, to make in on the Isle of Man. So I'm looking yeah. for those swords everywhere. <laughs> There's a few a few on display for sure. Yeah. And some that were only pieces. So yeah. All right. Good. Good. Um I apologize for my terrible connection. I'm wondering if I should move my car. Um it's so, working now. are we doing okay now? You, if you remove your, take your video off like Angela Try has, Alison, mm-hmm. then it does mm-hmm. help a bit sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll do our best. I just have one bar, so I will, I can also move my car till I have a better connection. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is, is that a little better? Yes, yes. yes. yes okay. You yeah. disappeared only for one moment before. Yes. Okay, good, good. Um, Mark- does anybody have anything about the next chapter? That they had prepared because I didn't see anything. Yeah, Marco, Marco's just um, signed in on that one. Wonderful, wonderful. So yes. You've prepared something, have you, Marco? Yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, um, this this chapter is important for me because like, once again, I read this book uh, later in life, la- la- later in my in my practice. So. Um, I didn't know uh, until a few years ago, about one year ago, two years ago, I didn't know about Doreen's experience with, um, you know, with the psychic realm and with um, uh, Brexpeer, this this, um, witch. So obviously... um, we don't we don't need a summary here it's it's a very simple chapter she's telling us about these um contacts these uh, psychic experiences that she had with a uh, um a dead witch a spirit of a witch uh Brexpeer, who tells her about uh, his own coven the members of of the coven his wife marjorie 
Um, then he mentions William Innes, Martin Young, and Anne uh, Knott. And, and she, she tells us her experience. It's interesting because since the beginning, she says, well, I'm going to tell you this story. You're obviously free to believe it or not. However, I believe it's important to share it. And uh, Again, historically, I think it's very important that she does this because we know that, again, in the Coven of Atho, um, the contact with uh, the inner planes, it's it's a very common practice. And, and the tools uh, used for this are very renowned, obviously within... within uh, the uh, the system of the Coven of Arto, um, very renowned objects, um, uh, objects used like mirrors and 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 the famous witch balls uh, slash uh, fishing floats that I like so much. So I find it very interesting. I find interesting the fact that a person like Doreen, who is so uh, clear, who doesn't have any time for any. For any invention, for that, for any jokes, for any and anything that it's not particularly real and provable, I find it interesting that she um, was so brave to decide to dedicate a chapter to something that she knew could have been criticized by everyone, because you cannot prove um, your psychic experience usually. Um, Again, once again, it's interesting. She, um, through through her reports on Breakspe um, Breakspeare, she um, tells us about objects. Once again, objects, uh, a large black hilted knife uh, and like an old fashioned carving knife in a homemade leather um, uh, sheath. Uh, we have them. We've got a lot of them. So that make that gives sense to our uh, to our objects once again. Um, she speaks about the staff, the cauldron, the cord. Um, I found it interesting that she um, specifies that the cord was not silk. And I think it, this is because she wanted to give a very clear difference between a certain practice, uh, co comparing a certain practice to uh, a Breakspeare's practice and probably the other traditions she met uh, after after Gardner. Uh, when she describes this this uh, cord, she describes it as a, um, a length of hemp cord with a loop at one end. It was whipped with string to prevent it uh, fraying. Uh, it's interesting how uh, in detail she, she goes all the time. Again, she mentions again, crystal gazing. Um, here again, um, she mentions a piece of skin, lamb skin, magical figures on it in red. Now we know the red and a piece of skin are all characteristics of the Coven of Arthur's um, practice. Uh, I think no one knew when this was published about these details of the Coven of Arthur. Again, she's not saying She's not describing them as characteristics of the Coven of Arthur. We now know after published books, the research uh, um, of other colleagues. Um, I like when she tells us about the fact that she used some of the, um, uh, um, of the spells or of the prayers that Breakspear um, mentioned to her in a Witchcraft for Tomorrow. I think it's quite a, a, um, a declaration there, such as this practice is the one I want to leave to everyone, to, to, um, to the new generation. I'm talking about the chant, Black Spirits and White, um, uh, the one which also appears in some form in the Macbeth. Uh, <clears throat> and also I like how Breakspeare um, gives us um, a declaration about the fact that the craft, uh, which was the the, the craft uh, coeval to Doreen, was 
too full of book learning. So it's, um, I wonder if this opinion from uh, Breakspeare was really also Doreen's opinion about uh, contemporary uh, companions in witchcraft, uh, too heavy based on, on books and on knowledge and less based on um, the primary experience uh, on field, I would, I would say. Um, doo -doo -doo. And yes, I think, I think this is, this is all I had to say about this chapter. Thank you, Marco. That was, I, I agree with you that that was brave of her to make the choice to share this in this way. Uh, it was, uh, I, I, her storytelling um, of something that happened to her inwardly is just as powerful as the storytelling of things that she invented herself. And, you know, as writers would know, it's, it's hard to be able to differentiate between them sometimes. <laughs> so and that, like, it's all from the same source and inspiration comes from all places. So I will take it as it's given for sure. Anything else about this chapter? I, I feel like I want to read this over and over again. <laughs> There's so much in there to dig into. All right. And do we have a, anyone for our, our is it, was it the last chapter? Yeah, um, the, other, the, the next chapter is uh, Robert Cochrane, Magister, which yeah. well, I don't think we've got anyone that's read. Well, we can all talk that. about that. Yes. Yeah, go on then. Yeah, is that all right? We just do it together? Yes, that's a good yeah. idea. I just meet myself. When I when I learned about Doreen for the first time, it was as um, at the time that she was working still with Robert Cochran. I guess that that was what I that that's what I was reading about her, and that she was um, impressed by him, just as she describes in this chapter, as a charismatic figure. Um, uh, but you know, attractive and uh, and and seemingly very uh, authentic, and uh, and then later on in the chapter she describes her her disillusionment with him, um, um, which I I don't think um, takes away from the meaning of what she discovered in his works uh, in many ways. Uh, you know, he he may or may not be what he represented himself to be, but it still sort of touched her in a, in a hard to describe way. Um, and uh, and the, I think she was looking very hard for things that were different and found it, um, and then was dis disappointed to discover that a lot of what Cochran presented was just in opposition to Gardner's uh, craft. He wanted to be different from that, and he wanted to present himself as different from that. Um, what what in particular uh, struck people about this chapter, or if you have any memories or or thoughts about Cochran in general, you can kind of share them here. I, I like when Doreen uh, declares her desire of leaving because she had enough of all <laughs> the all the all the fights. Um, I I found a bit of myself in there. To be fair, I I I think maybe I don't know what's your experience, and I would be super curious <laughs> about it. But I have found a lot of uh, jealousies and, and fights and, and stupid, really stupid uh, fights between covens and sometimes traditions and things like that. And, and, and now I really feel like, ah, oh, you know what? <laughs> Enough. <laughs> I, I don't care about all this. I don't, I, I feel I just want to be uh, abstracted by all this and then, and do my own thing. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think you are definitely not alone in that. Um, when, when humans allow their petty jealousies to distract from the work, um, it's very easy to get uh, frustrated and, and fed up. Um, I think she is very patient, honestly. She, she tolerates people for who they present themselves to be. And, uh, and then when they turn out not to meet her needs, she discards them with, with rapidity. <laughs> uh, but but I, I, I mean, I, I guess I have a very different perspective on this than, than maybe some other people do. But, but what you describe, Marco, is what a lot of witches have told me to, not just witches, but all different pagans. And they get frustrated by people being terrible to each other. And that they expected more from them. Um, I want to let other people talk too about your thinking about this. It makes you think about the perfect love and perfect trust uh, idea, which is so precious. It, it's it's like a, a, a precious um, a, a piece of trade. Uh, a, a precious material that it's rare really and if you have it you can have a coven or a group or, or whatever you 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 use your practice with but it's very rare yeah the idea of perfect love and perfect trust as as she does describe earlier is a, comes probably from a a quote from uh from crowley um Mm -hmm. I think the idea in the craft is there are many ideas about what people think about that, what that means and why one might care um, to, to put their trust in one another. Um, and I, I don't always agree that that's what that's all about, but I, I think um, for whatever reasons, we, we gather in groups to do this and we put our, trust in one another to some degree even if it's not perfect and uh and expect expect one another to deliver their best selves to to the craft to each other and that is not always what people turn out to be and that can be really painful i i do love her elegy uh that she wrote for him uh, and, and read it frequently when friends die. And um, I, I, I value her thinking here about her disillusionment and what, what she took from the experience um, and her willingness to be honest about what happened. Like she really loved him and she was wrong. Uh, and we, that happens sometimes to people in, in groups. I can go on and on about this because I, I live in a world where community is at the forefront. I, I work in the inter intentional communities movement. And so experiencing people in groups is sort of like my, the primary source of my, uh, uh, my, uh, my pleasure and enjoyment of life. <laughs> uh, and people can be frustrating and, and terrible, um, but they kind of are, if you know what to expect, you, it's not surprising anymore. You know that people are going to disappoint you and you just have to be ready to do that. Um, to, to be disappointed by people. <laughs> I won't, uh, I won't uh, wax eloquent about that, but um, I, I think this chapter is really good for people who are new to the craft to read because it gives them a sense of like, why would we care to continue our journey if we're just going to get slapped in the face with lies again and again? That's not all lies. It's not. Does anybody else have thoughts about that? I won't make you talk, but you know, your thoughts are meaningful to me too. Um, the whole experience of, of Doreen's life um, is that she takes what she gets from various sources. She sort of makes sense of it on her own. 
and then eventually goes off, continues to be on her own. She ended up being a largely solitary witch later in life and seemed okay with that. I think, um, I'm, well, perfect love and perfect trust. Um, is it a bit like um, when, you know, bikers have a bond and they kind of do a blood exchange and, you know, they, they have um, a bond of uh, honour that they would never betray each other? Is it like that? Or is that what, one form of perfect love and perfect trust? That does seem to be a, a valuable bond to yeah. be able to pledge that you will not betray the trust of your brothers. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that that's... You would die yeah. for them. That's what bikers say anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a tribal thing as well, mm -hmm. isn't it? That honour, that feeling of honour. We have found our people and we will... Yes. And we'll pledge ourselves to them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think uh, I think I see it as a little more like in our striving for being our best selves, we strive to be like, you know, godly or you know, whatever, to be yeah. to be better than humans. And um mm. and when we when we are able to do that, then we can we can approach perfect love and perfect trust but I don't think it's between humans I don't think our pledge is that yeah. I think it is a perfect love that we have for our deities and and that in in being in, in agreeing to come into a group with that love and trust then we can achieve some level of intimacy that we can't any other way I think yes I agree. And I think Doreen had had high expectations of this particular human that were not met. And it did not deter her from striving for more. I think that's meaningful. She did not give up on people. She no. did not give up on the craft. She just kept looking. Do you think she, um, she gave people the benefit of the doubt, but stood back and watched carefully? and that you know um decided when the time had come that they hadn't actually um deserved her uh, benefit benefit of the doubt <laughs> you know what i mean hadn't met the the bar that she put there probably trust we have people in the United States who remind me a lot of Robert Cochran in their charismatic qualities and um, the ways in which people put their trust in them and, and then later were disappointed. Um, so yeah. I don't think it's a unique story. No, <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> no. Are, are they as angry as, as Cochrane towards <laughs> someone, an, another tradition or another... Are they as angry? <laughs> Maybe not. I think they do inspire great anger in others. Ah, uh -huh. well, which is uh, even worse, probably. I think if you come into a group and say, you know, you're all wrong, and what I have is better, follow me instead, I think you're going to reap what you sow. You know, yeah. that, that sort of um, cultish quality is not unique uh to cochran but i mean it does not end well i i, I don't think so <laughs> um, you know intelligence and talent burn out but i don't think it i don't think it had to be that way it's really sad it's a very sad story mm. you know, we have his memory we have the things that he created and yet just think of all the amazing things he could have created if he had stayed alive longer. Mm. Very sad. Okay. I, I remember as a as oh. a twenty year old, I remember being fascinated by him and going, "Ooh, I want to find out more about him." And I think now, as a almost fifty year old, I'm I feel a little differently about it. Um, let's not let's not try to be like that gentleman. No. Well, 
Um, oh, so I, I, in my email, I said um, if less than 50% don't turn up, but it's been so interesting to me that I think we should carry on for the next month as well, November. It only goes up until December anyway, doesn't it? The calendar. If the we finish, if we finish this book, then yeah. November will be it, right? Yeah, I'd like to, to do that because the next one is Leslie Roberts, Kingdom of Alex Sanders, Feminist Witchcraft, the Picking Gill material and Into the Age of Aquarius, which yes. all of those are really fascinating. And um, I'd like to just see it to the end if everyone wants to. And I hope Dodie can come as well next time. Yeah. And do you think it might help if we gave two dates? Or is Sunday is really the day when people aren't at work, isn't it? Most people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I suppose Perhaps we, we could have that be our default, but, uh, but do a little survey to see if people would prefer a different day. Yeah. Just to get good the or bad. Or... Yeah. Okay. I'll put something together and people can weigh in and. Is that oh, all, all right? Thank you. Or unless you want to do it, you, I would stand back. And no, I'm, I, um, you're better at it. You're more experienced at book clubs than I am. <laughs> I haven't done that many. <laughs> Organizing them is the hardest part. Well, this part yeah. is very lovely. It's so good to oh. see all your faces. And uh, <laughs> thank you for tolerating my terrible connection here. On no, the it's not too bad. Mm. It's fine. Yeah. We're very grateful, Maggie. We're very grateful for... for um you taking over these book clubs it's yeah. it's a big thing for us thank you very much it is definitely my pleasure uh, i feel um just so blessed every time i see you all on my zoom i want to show you the lake too here i'm going to turn off my it's very loud um it's like the ocean i don't know if you've ever seen the great lakes but they are very ocean like and really? today in particular is, is quite oh, lovely so i will give you a little you farewell yeah on the shores Here's my mute, but I'll get out and show you what I see. Oh, wow. Look, oh, wow, it's enormous. Yeah. If you can't see what she's showing you, pin her on the um, choices. Wow, it does look like the ocean, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah. Lovely. Wow. <laughs> um, can I ask, I do not have the app, so I cannot um, edit a document, the Google document. Can somebody um, put me down oh. your adapter next time? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me which one you want me to do and I'll do it. What would you like? A feminist witchcraft? Right, whichever. I'm absolutely fine with whichever one. I think you'd be good at feminist witchcraft. <laughs> Thank you. I'll do feminist witchcraft. Yeah. Okay. Alison is down for feminist witchcraft. Thank you, Monica. Uh, I can see that there is Dawn for the picking in, picking in material. Who? Dawn. Oh, Dawn. Mm -hmm. I don't know who Dawn is. Who's Dawn? Uh, Dawn. I, I uh, think I'll turn the recording off now. Yeah. She she is 